Good morning, all delegates. Uh, great to meet all of you, wherever you are. And of course, honored and a privilege to speak to Aparna this morning. Uh, I know she's probably extremely busy. And uh, but as we all know, you know, Zoom is such a great product. We're all using it now and have been using it for some time. But before we deep dive into all the great work that you've been doing uh, through your career, Aparna, uh, I'd love to understand more about your background. I mean, you know, you know how you became who you were, um, how that shaped your interests. I mean, you completed your your bachelor's at in accounting at Marquette, Wisconsin, in Wisconsin. I'm from Chicago, so, you know, fellow Midwesterner. And then uh, you went to Harvard Law School for your JD uh, before heading to Silicon Valley. So could you tell us more about like how your undergraduate and graduate years shaped your interests? You know, what were some of the overarching lessons you learned from that time? You know, David, I, I would love to say I knew what I wanted to do in life at that time. I probably didn't. And actually, I know I didn't, it's not probably. Um, I had a lot of varying interests. I could have done so many different things. Um, and it's hard to know at that age, and I, I know it's hard to believe, but it's hard to know at that age what will make you happy. You were just sort of experimenting. And I actually did not take time in between college and law school. And, you know, I was interested in going to law school. I'm not entirely sure I knew exactly what it entailed or exactly what would come out at the other end of law school. Um, it was sort of a risk I took. Um, and I went with it. And I think yeah. more, most importantly, what I learned is, you know, the education is the education. And yes, you train for a certain outcome per se, but it's really, the education also gives you a framework on how to think and how to organize your thoughts, et cetera. Um, and that was probably the biggest sort of takeaway. I mean, you could you can do a lot with a law degree, but it just gives you a, a, a foundation for logical reasoning. That, I mean, I would say, that is probably the one insight I took away from after all my education. Yeah, I would say uh, uh, I, I totally agree with you on that. Um, I'm, I'm curious also how much of it was gut versus, you know, this is the, the, the job market. Uh, I want to follow you know, X, Y, and Z careers. Gut, mostly yeah. gut. Um, I'm not sure at that age in 20s, early 20s, that you really have that much of a like life experience to actually know what you know to do from an instinct perspective you could i mean there are yeah. certainly people who could i personally did not um and i think sometimes you just have to try a few things until you land on something that works for you yeah i think it's impressive that you grounded yourself in numbers knowing that part of the business very well and then law i mean two great you know double threat as we call it uh, mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the in the Silicon Valley world. You know, you, you were chief legal officer at Zoom before your current role as COO, but your career in law began at Wilson Sonsini, which is a great law firm, worked with many folks there where you were doing corporate securities um, and securities. And they continued at your role as general counsel for Nimble Storage and Magento, as Amy was saying earlier, Harvard undergrads are encouraged to pursue a well-rounded education to prep mm -hmm. for the very sort of inter interdisciplinary world. I mean, as someone with both a legal and operational background, could you tell us more about this sort of intersection of law and business? Well, I would say I've always been interested on the on, on anything sort of in the business world. Yeah. Everything from the entrepreneur, you know, I was very fascinated as a kid, like, you know, I've had lemonade stands and sold cupcakes at the bake sale or even sort of outside my house on a on a on a table in a chair. Um, yeah. So very interested in sort of the generation of economy, I would say. And I think there is an interplay, but of course, between the legal world and the business world. But as I tell my kids, like math is in everything we do. If you go, you know, <laughs> my son is just starting to go get pizza on his own. Um, <laughs> and so we sent him yesterday and we're like, hey, here's 15 bucks. If you get to keep the change, you should count the change. Those are the kinds of things that, you know, I think when you said a strong fundamental sort of quant background, um, yes, you, I mean, math is fundamental to everything we do. You don't have, we don't have to get into very deep math. I don't have to be like mm -hmm. a PhD in applied math, but you should be able to, to see how, you know, a business operates 
if you're a part of it, you know, you want to know about the health of the business as well. And then, you know, there are asked, so every business is implicated, you know, there are various um, factors that affect that business. And it just so happens that one of those is sort of how we operate with each other and in a, in a world and that sort of dictated by the legal world. You have lots of different functions that can have impact on a business and it's your responsibility to look at it with a particular lens. But at the end of the day, yeah. you know, you are also part of an organization or a initiative or some sort of enterprise and you want to know how it does <laughs> and how to grow yeah. it. Yeah, very, very wise and very um, great insight. Um, speaking of, of Zoom, uh, you know, so if we talk about the growth, I mean, it, it's uh, it's been incredible, right? I think everyone knows that it's a buzzword. Uh, it's now part of sort of our our everyday language. I mean, I mean, the usage, you know, throughout the pandemic has been humongous. I mean, prior to the lockdowns, people typically, you know, use platforms like FaceTime, Skype, Messenger, et cetera. Uh, organizations like, you know, use Google Meet, Teams for Microsoft uh, earlier to the pandemic for remote meetings, but Zoom really became sort of the video conferencing platform and has grown immensely to deliver this really great experience around the world. I was reading, you know, in 2020, February, Zoom gained 2.2 million more users than in, in the entire year of 2019. And after that, just exponentially grew to these huge numbers. And I'm wondering, you know, it's like we used to call it at Google being strapped to a rocket ship. Um, you know, could you walk us through your like typical workday uh, during the height of scaling Zoom? Oh, it was a little insane, honestly, David. Um, I can imagine. You know, we we would I would start pretty early in the morning. We have a global team, and so especially for the folks on the East Coast, you know, they're up up and at it you know, pretty early for us here on the West Coast. Um, you know, we also have. Europe and Asia, as most international companies would. Um, so for me, a typical day starts at seven um, or would have started at seven. I've now pushed it to about eight, but a typical day starts at seven. And then, you know, it's just back to back to back. It could be scheduled meetings. It could be, you know, spontaneous, um, you know, deal with the issues of the day. Um, Grab. A, I I would actually start. I started to, and and I was more conscious of this after I looked at my Apple Watch and realized I wasn't walking that much at all. But I started to take some meetings walking outside okay. my house, um, which really helped. And so you know, and it also gives you some clarity of thought to get the juices flowing while you're you know working. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I you know I also found that the pandemic was very useful for me in the sense that. I saw my children a lot, ironically, um, even though the day was long and I was spending so much time of it at work. Uh, the fact that I was home, as in everybody was home, my kids were home as well. I mean, means, you know, every, you can have stolen moments with each other mm -hmm. um, in yeah. between meetings or, you know, we would grab, you know, five minute lunch together, et cetera. Um, it was actually, that part of it was, was very lovely, I would say. Um, yeah. If there's anything lovely about a pandemic, no, but you know, that part of it was, was quite surprising. And I, I guess my day would just keep going. I mean, I have dinner with the family for about 20 minutes and then keep going. And I think the days ended around midnight into the next day. And then you rinse and repeat and do it all over again. Um, and it was like that for quite, for several months. Since then, we've been able to you know, expand quite a bit and we've done a lot of hiring um, where we are in a much more sort of solid footing from an, uh, um, uh, a resources perspective, uh, which is great. And so obviously, you know, that, that would result in less sort of intensity in the day. So maybe I'd start at eight and probably finish yeah. by six, maybe check email at night um, and things like that. Yeah, I guess with that, I, I think that's, that's fascinating that you were able to adapt personally, professionally, uh, also, you know, going from a private company, almost like a startup to, you know, a, a public company, that must have been a, a big, yeah. uh, you know, well, switch for you to, to have to do as well. We had been public. We actually went public in April, 2019. Um, mm -hmm. So that part wasn't that much of a switch. We had already been sort of operating in that mode for quite a bit, yeah. several months. Um, and for me, I mean, it's the company being public. Yes, there's some other 
reporting obligations that you have to have. And, you, you know, you, of course, you've got it, you have solid governments, but you governance, but we, you know, we were, we were well on our way to doing that anyway. Um, so I think we were in a, from a public to private perspective, not that much of a difference. I think the volume and the enthusiasm with which users adopted the platform um, so quickly. We, you know, we went from, mm -hmm. you know, I would say 10 daily meeting participants per day at the end of December to about 300 million daily meeting participants today um, per day. That's you know, sometime in April of 2020. That that is insane. Yeah. I mean, for a SaaS yeah. product to be able to add as much capacity so quickly, flexibly. Um, is unheard of. And that I think goes to the very scalable cloud native architecture that we are built on. Our technology is tremendous from that perspective yeah. Um, yeah. and have no sort of outages, lack of reliability. You still, you know, we had to make sure that the kids could get on school, including my own kids. Um, you know, if they click the link and it doesn't work, it's not an option, you know, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, there's one question. Uh, they had, uh, there was also uh, people were wondering about um, the international um, growth, right? I know uh, Google was, you know, US first and then international was second early days, but then it flip flopped. I'm um, curious for you guys what that looked like, uh, you know, sort of pre Very and post. Similar. Mm -hmm. I think when you start a business in the United States, it's like you want to use, want to attack what you've got close at hand first. Um, and then you start to expand beyond your border. Um, no different for us. If you think about it, we, prior to pandemic, and still now we're focused on workplace collaboration and sort of improving uh, everybody's efficiency, flexibility, um, choice uh, in the workplace. And as part of that, you start in your local backyard. <laughs> you know, I think uh, some of the yeah. first um, customers that Zoom had were tech companies and universities. Universities, and even sort of up and down the West Coast, I think Stanford was one of our first university customers. Makes yeah. total sense um, because it's right there. That's you know? <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So, and then as you grow, you you look for more and more opportunity. And I think the for us international is definitely a lead, like a very high growth pillar of opportunity for us today. Um, and you will see that as we expand across the globe, put more resources in and drive more um, uh, usage. Outside of the US and Canada, I would say, um, you know, countries like India, you wouldn't believe it, Turkey is has heavy, heavy usage as well. We have a strong sort of international following and I think part of the reason, David, is because the service just works. It works whether, you know, you, yeah. the, the, the video is crystal clear, the audio is really good, you won't drop, um, if, even if you're talking to someone with a very low bandwidth um, situation, you could be over the, in India, for example, it could be over the PSTN network. Um, it's those kinds of things that, you know, make it suitable for, for lots of varied use cases in an international um, uh, framework, whether it's hospitals and telehealth, yeah. education, uh, even government services, you know, it just makes, it lends itself for a good experience. I have to agree with you there. I think that's what says everything about it, whether you know much about the branding or the message, the fact that it's sort of enterprise grade, you know, for anyone to use and it's seamless. Yeah. I think, and you know, people need their reliability in this age too, when the yeah. only communication is over Zoom. Well, what's lovely about the UI, I think, is that, you know, my everybody from my mother-in-law to my kids, to our CEO, like it doesn't matter who you are, it's easy yeah. to pick up and use. And if you think about it from an enterprise, when you said enterprise grade, it's an enterprise grade platform, but extremely flexible. So one of the biggest, yeah. Um, pieces of feedback that we get from the IT admins is we love your product because we don't have to hire five people to go and implement it. It's super easy. Yeah. So it's not just easy for the end user. It's also easy for the IT administrator and it's a significant value. Yeah, exactly. I think Google's just trying to catch on to what you guys are doing right. I mean, having worked there before, I think you guys have a better product <laughs> in your way ahead. Um, but I do think the ease of use and sort of the easy onboarding is, is a key thing about your success too. Absolutely. And you know, speaking of, of the features and, and, and uh, their product, um, 
uh, when why it's successful is, is about the, the privacy. So yeah, I know one of the missions for you guys is to make it as secure as possible, which it's been. I mean, it's you guys have shown a lot of commitment, you know, to that mission. I think uh, in July last year, you know, you guys rolled out a 90 day plan to address security and privacy. So more around that, I mean, could you tell us, you know, some of the biggest improvements made during the plan and sort of what are your main priorities uh, on working on Zoom's security efforts? Yeah, I mean, we we did, I, what, ha what happened last year was we were, again, focused on workplaces and we continue to be focused on workplaces. And in a, in a workplace environment, when you sell to the IT administrator, that's your you know, primary buyer, you're, give, you're delivering a platform that is very scalable and flexible. And yeah. the IT administrator sort of decides for the company, you know, in, the, in sort of the whatever group, CIO group or whatever the group that they're in, what type of settings they're going to have, what options they're going to make available for their employees, et cetera. And usually there is a little bit of a trade-off between sort of user experience and control at the user level and what sort of security and privacy you offer at the platform level, at sort of the company level. Then fast forward a little bit. And if you have, you know, we, as the pandemic rolled through the world, we, what, the, the, the point in time where it hit me personally, where I said, okay, this is gonna go crazy. This is about to have hit an inflection point was when we turned on, we had, we had, started in the far east and then we had offered the service for free for k-12 through schools we made that offer available if you were a school yeah. and you know you wanted to continue your services to your kids over zoom we we made it happen for you and we removed the 40 limit minute limit for our free accounts um, for the schools and that took off like wildfire but when it hit the u.s is when it really sort of hit the the real inflection point where, you know, my, even my kids, friends, moms and dads were calling. I had a, a, a school mom call and say, oh, I finally figured out what you do. I know what Zoom is. Um, and then I realized, okay, this is going to take off. Um, and it did. And then you had, you know, understandably consumers and users who hadn't used Zoom before sort of turning off waiting rooms, you know, or, you know, telling people um, broadly posting their meeting IDs on you know, chat channels, et cetera, not realizing that there is an underbelly in this world that is not so savory and will take advantage of that, some of that trust and openness um, when we're all in a pandemic trying to connect with each other. So we realized that we really had to do a few things, amp, amp our security profile up quite a bit and with it do a lot of education. So for example, you know, we um, put a security, there's a security button. On, if you're the host, you have a security button or a security sort of area at the bottom left of your screen. Um, if something happens, if you have an unwanted person, you can report it. You have some tools at your fingertips to, you know, um, uh, stop some of the activity that you could do on Zoom. Um, and basically take back control of your meeting. You can, you know, sort of eject a user, et cetera. Those tools became available um, or we made them available for users and started to educate users. We also, you know, for certain types of situations, we said you have to have either a passcode or mm -hmm. mandatory waiting rooms. We, we, and then we, we added the education to it. We did a lot to tell our users or share with our users all of the different ways to make their meetings safe. You know, the other thing is we had written a privacy policy before that enterprises were fine with <laughs> and had no problems because they understood, it looked, you know, it looked like an enterprise grade privacy policy. But when a, 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 a like when my mother-in-law reads my privacy policy, she needs to understand what it says too. And so in that yeah, kind of situation, we rewrote our privacy policy to make it more plain English. It sounds so simple. We, we you know, we had, we had always taken the position that we weren't going to sell um, user data or sell sort of any information about our users and not monetize that part of the business. And we do today. Um, and so we, you know, we rejiggered the privacy policy and made it more readable for um, your everyday consumer. I mean, I could understand it as well. So, you know, those are the kinds of things we also gave customers a lot more choice. So for example, 
you know, we have a backend network and when you, especially when you're connecting with international participants, um, it helps from a usability perspective mm -hmm. that they are able to connect in through a data center or a connection point that is close to them. And that is what lends itself to extremely good video and audio. Uh, well, we put, you know, in it, it, it for our paid user, users at least, we put the choice of where they want to connect through into the hands of our users. Yeah. So we put a lot of effort into giving our companies as well as our individual end users choice on how they operate and also you know, added on top of that a lot of education. I think that's excellent because you know you're basically growing and on you know at the same time on the fly you know making changes making sure people are safe uh you know rolling out you know uh new versions of the product uh while people are waiting you know you guys are doing it so quickly and I, that's to me very impressive as a company that you know, needs to address privacy in real time um and also i think you know what's happened change wise uh you know talk about quick growth and having to adapt is you know working from home so you know a lot of us are getting vaccinated now and you know, obviously, you know, probably going to return in some capacity to be at, at the office. Um, so we know sort of the hybrid model is probably here to stay. Uh, in your opinion, you know, what do you think that will, you know, bring the companies and employees and how has it affected sort of your own and personal life? You know, I think the word is going to be hybrid. Um, yeah. What I've noticed myself is that sentiment has sort of ebbed and flowed as the pandemic has worn on. It's, you know, when we all first went home in March, I think people were scared, genuinely scared. We hadn't, didn't have vaccines and also intrigued. You know, I, I can't lie. I would put a load of laundry in before a meeting and then sort of switch to the dryer in between the next one, you know, <laughs> and it was convenient. I'm not doing laundry at yeah. night anymore, which is great. Okay, um, wonderful. One <laughs> couple more minutes at night for myself. Um, I think there was a bit of a euphoria when folks went home, you know, workers like myself, knowledge workers like myself. And then after a while you get lonely, you know, you miss your colleagues, you miss most of what I hear from our own employee base is they want the collaboration and the socialization. It's very mm -hmm. similar to why kids would want to go back to school. Um, yeah. It's the socialization piece. It's seeing your friends. You can still learn, you know, especially my 13 year old tells me this, you can still learn online, but I miss my friends, mom. Um, you know, that is strong. I mean, there's a lot of use cases where you can do most, if not all of it over Zoom. You just miss, you know, your colleague and grabbing lunch with them and just talking about something different and sort of seeing them in the flesh. Then, you know, once you start to open up, you realize I kind of want both. I want flexibility. I want productivity. I want to be efficient and I want my choice. So, you know, if I want to be doing, a, if I'm working on a slide deck for the board, for example, I don't need, you know, group space. I don't need group think until I get to the point where someone else is reviewing it, but I can work on that by myself. Why do I need to be sitting in a commute and battling traffic and yeah. thinking about all the things that I have to do when I come home, um, you know, to, to go and work on my slide deck at, at the office? At the same time, if I need, if I'm a product in, pro, in the product team and I want to ID, ideate, and I think that you know my team is going to get more benefit out of it from being together in the room and feeding off of each other um, physically, then you know that's that's a that's a great use case as well. I think the word hybrid is going to define how the future of work and how we go back to work, uh, and I think it's very appropriate that it's, you know, Zoom is sort of at the, at the forefront of that transformation. And we hear it from our customers. I mean, they're asking us. I think it will also impact how we get together. Are we, you know, there was a strong trend towards like the open office bay with chair next to chair next to chair in like a straight line. Is that gonna be how we get together? Well, you know, there's, there are folks who said, you know, thank you very much, Upper and I love you greatly, but I don't really wanna sit two feet away from you in a, in a post pandemic world. I think we're all very now much more conscious about how we interact with each other, how we breathe and then breathe on someone else. You know, we're just all very yeah. con conscious about this. <laughs> so is yeah. it going to be bigger, bigger kind of, you know, group workspaces where it's like in a circle so that you can see everybody else? Or is it going to be those long bays of open office space? I don't know, but I do think it's going to be a hybrid world um, with, 
multiple use cases imagined for group work? Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I think it made everyone, you know, personally speaking, think about what's a productive way of doing work or meeting people, right? Whether it's traveling, yep. you know, do you need to travel everywhere? A lot of things can be done over Zoom or, you know, be working from home, that is, or from a cafe. Uh, and it's not just, you know, sort of a luxury or an afterthought, but I really think that no. that's, it's going to blend itself into the future of how we work. Oh my goodness, David, there are people that I, like there are um, employees that I've met and I work with very closely that I have never met in person. I've only met through Zoom. And, you know, it's so funny because I went into the office the first time I came back, I went into the office a couple of Wednesdays ago. It was, there was nobody there except for me and this, um, our, one of our, our head of comms. And we were, she was, do, we were doing an, I was doing an interview for CNBC and they wanted to do it in the office and, you know, sort of have an energetic interview and walk around, which was, fa- was great, but it was so, it was so surreal because I hadn't met this person. I've talked so much to this person. I know this person so well for the last year and a half, but I'd never met her in person. And I was arguing with her because I swear I've met her in person. And she said, no, there's no humanly <laughs> possible. I didn't start until this time. And we were already, you know, yeah. we, we weren't back in the office and I didn't come to your house, but sometimes you, you know, you, you feel like through zoom, you know, someone so well, you, I, it kind of blurs for me. I forget whether I've met them or, or not. And they look so much like, you know, they, they are the person in the video there's, there's no difference. Yeah. Um, uh, except we just joke that we need to start, you know, taking our touch my appearance filter down a little bit as we get back into the office so people can see what our real wrinkles look like. Well, like. at least you have it and Google doesn't have it yet. So that's why <laughs> I'm like using too much. Uh, speaking of which, you know, I've, yeah, and as an investor, I've in, uh, written so many checks from our fund to companies we've never met in person. So I think it's become just a, a common thread that there's trust there and that, you know, that this is a, a medium that we'll use. So looking at the future, you know, in terms of product development, uh, when we look at Zoom, What's, what's next for you guys? I mean, uh, what developments can users expect in the near future? Well, you know, look for us to be facilitating the hybrid, the hybrid workforce. So for example, we have a smart gallery feature that we've announced where, um, you know, if you are, I'll give you an example. On our exec team, yeah. we typically had most of the people in the conference room at San Jose, and then we had one person, our global CIO, coming in from New York, who, Harry, who lives in New York. And when we went into work from home mode, Harry's biggest comment was, you know, I can participate better now. I can get a word in because you guys are all mm-hmm. chatting, chatting, chatting in the in the conference room. And if you're on Zoom and you're, you know, you see a bunch of heads, you know, uh, you don't, the video stream is a bunch of heads in a conference room. You don't actually see their faces. It's hard to interject. It's just not natural. And so what we are going to do is, you know, you know, up to three video streams using AI, you know, basically create this box, this multiple box appearance for the person that is not, that is remote. So that they will, instead of seeing a bunch of people around a table and the backs of their heads or depending on the camera angle, uh, they will see each person in their own box. And so you can participate more, you can sort of react more to the facial expression, to the intonation, et cetera, if you have the same sort of setup of the boxes uh, when you're remote, as opposed to seeing people in a circle in the back of their heads. So the, you know, that's what we call our smart gallery feature. Hmm. We also, you know, we have come up with you know multiple ways for companies and workplaces to manage people coming into the office, leaving the office. I think seamless connections between their Zoom rooms, for example, you know, with the help of our hardware partners. And there's one particular. There's the Neat Bar. We can. Um, manage the number of people in the conference room you can you know see on your dashboard how many people are in there versus the size the air quality the filtering the ambient environment and then you can also say you can also sort of gauge how many people are actually in the room versus remote versus coming in through zoom etc these are all avenues that we are working on to enable the hybrid environment, which we think is going to be, mm. as I said, the future of work, where you as an employee or executives in an organization enable a lot more flexibility, a lot more efficiency, a lot more productivity, ultimately by giving the employee choice and being able to manage that choice in a way that's conducive for the entire organization. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think uh, we're all going to be 
waiting with bated breath to see what great things are coming through there. Um, and just switching gears a little bit, uh, back when you were general counsel for Zoom, you were also, I don't know how you had time for it, but you served on the head of, uh, or served on the board of directors for the uh, nonprofit Fresh Lifelines for Youth, an mm -hmm. organization that provides mentorship for children within the juvenile justice system who are at risk for incarceration. So could you tell us a little bit about like, you know, why you participated in that and, you know, what, you know, what does it take to level the playing field for children with vastly different resources? Yeah. I mean, my interest in FLY, first of all, it's such a wonderful organization. Um, it was founded by a woman, Krista Gannon, um, who had been, you know, herself, she had been a intern at um, Juvenile Hall in Chicago, which was pretty rough by any stretch of the imagination. And she had gone into this line of work thinking she was going to, she had a friend who had been raped and she had gone into this line of work thinking she was going to put the bad guys away and take out potential rapists um, and take, the, you know, put them behind bars so that they're not a threat to society. And what she realized when she went into Juvie Hall for this internship was that they're just kids, you know, these people yeah. who allegedly commit heinous crimes in a young age, they're vulnerable, nervous, delightful children, and especially young Black men, to be perfectly mm -hmm. frank, um, or boys, they're boys, they're kids, they're babies. Um, and so she was very affected by that and then flipped her mission, life's mission around to say, I want to help kids in those positions who haven't really had great role models, who haven't had the resources that, you know, I had, um, you know, if I had to go to Stanford, et cetera, I, I didn't, I had those resources. What if we gave them those resources? What if we gave them some hope and some role models so that they could, you know, feel more productive and do more with their lives. And that was the idea between behind Fresh Lifelines for Youth. And it was lovely. So basically what they, what they did is they went into programs. So they would intercept a child either at school or right before they went into Juvie Hall. And, you know, they would put a cohort, they ran a couple cohorts a year where they put bigger groups of students into this something that they call the law program where they educate you. You know, if you're a middle schooler, you should know that I can't drive without a license. You know, you'd be surprised yeah. what kids know and don't know these days, but some of these things you need to get taught uh, or you yeah. need to be taught. So, you know, they'd say, okay, marijuana is illegal or what to do when, a, when an ICE officer knocks on your door, like, what are your rights, right? What are your obligations and what mm -hmm. are your rights? You know, so they, they spend about six weeks and it's sort of mandatory for the kid to join the class, but it's after school and they spend about six weeks educating the children. And then from that and from surveys and from interacting with the children, they take, they use data to really identify who is ripe for change based on certain sort of factors, who, which kids are ready to make changes in their lives or in that position um, to adopt you know, to grow, to adopt a different way to, to, that are ripe for that kind of change. And they put them into an, a much more intensive, a two-year program where you're assigned a mentor, you go for offsites, you are, you know, you're, you're actively working and you try to sort of give, provide different options for this child. And so they have shown so much success that, you know, Santa, the, for example, Santa Clara County um, has tie-ups with the organization and sort of part of their juvenile hall, they, they're in Ana, Alameda County, they're in San Mateo County. Mm -hmm. um, and it's become much more of a formal option that the court system can use. They can, you know, I can just send you to Juvie Hall, I can send you into FLY as a stopgap measure, and then hopefully you don't end up in Juvie. Um, so that is sort of the, the mission of the organization. And the reason I joined, you know, I just, I feel so lucky. Um, and there have been, there have been so many people in my life that have helped me or prevented something bad from happening. And I just, you know, I like this idea of giving more people a level playing field. It seems more fair. It seems more just. Um, and I think we all are born with so much opportunity inside of us. And sometimes what happens yeah. outside of us tends to impact what we're able to do and accomplish in life. And this just makes the world a little bit a little bit, you know, more fair, more, more appropriate, more level for, um, 
people who otherwise wouldn't have it that way. Yeah, I mean, it's great to hear a very refreshing viewpoint from someone in your position, um, you know, who's in a huge corporate sort of, you know, responsibility and, um, you know, and, 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 and you know, place of, of work. And I'm curious, you know, um, from your own life, you know, you know, looking at mentors or role models that you've had, you know, how they might have shaped your own leadership style, you know, being a woman in leadership, right, for example, um, anyone that comes to mind and, you know, the second part of it is, well, you know, what needs to be done for there to be more women in corporate, you know, leadership positions? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. My, for me, my biggest mentor, I would say, would probably be my aunt, um, who mm -hmm. is a former, you know, sort of general manager of a business unit at HP, Hewlett Packard, wow. and then took a company public and, you know, has been at the helm of many different companies. And now in her 70s, is the CEO of a company that started as a social, you know, impact. It's still social impact, but it's one of these hybrid social impact slash for-profit companies. And, but she's really doing it to give women and underrepresented minorities a voice and an opportunity to have an economic, economic gain for themselves. And um, in areas where, you know, she's, her workforce comes from uh, small villages in Eastern India that otherwise wouldn't, you know, have had an internet connection. Um, yeah. You know, and, and now they have sort of buildings where big office buildings where women go to provide for their families um, and are so well respected in those communities because they are the breadwinners. Um, and then also, you know, New Orleans, she set up a, a site in New Orleans and Bhutan. I mean, you can, you hmm. name it, she's wow, got it. And it is very fascinating. So it's, it's role models like that um, who kind of blaze the trail for us, I would say. And a couple of things about my aunt, she's very tough, but she's very loving and you can be very, you can do both. Um, and I think that's, she's, 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 she, she's demands excellence from herself. She demands excellence from those around her, but she does it in such a loving way that you just can't help to mm -hmm. but comply or provide it back the excellence. So I would say, you know, those kinds of folks are my role models. Women in, in, in leadership positions and advancing women in leadership positions. Look, I think if you think it's so, if you have the mindset that it's, it's such a weird thing, then you're gonna project that. And I don't think it's weird. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, I don't think it's, um, it shouldn't be rare. So I try to, to not feel that way, to not, you know, I try, mm -hmm. I mean, it takes some conscious practice, but why shouldn't a woman be a leader? Why shouldn't we have a woman president? Or, you know, there, there is no reason, there's no really good reason as to why not. And so as long as you adopt that posture in your mindset, then you have more chance of it becoming re reality. If you keep thinking about reasons, it's sort of that, it's similar to the imposter syndrome that a lot of women yeah. face, like I shouldn't be here. If you feel that way, then, you know, that's, that if you yourself are letting yourself feel that way, then how can you expect someone else not to feel that way? And so I think the more we can kind of control our own, not control our thoughts, because you can't really control your thoughts, but the more you don't attach to those kinds of thoughts, you don't let yourself get affected by those kinds of thoughts, I think the better off for, um, for us all to achieve that objective. I fully agree. I, I think you do project what you feel at the moment, even, even in talking about imposter syndrome. I mean, it's not just women. I think men, including myself, have felt that way before, uh, whether it's a, a, an, an obvious insecurity or something in your mind, right? And uh, that's great that you've looked, because I can see that you've looked past that. And I don't see gender. I don't see a nationality. I see a hardworking person who has, you know, very dynamic thoughts, backgrounds, experiences. And, you know, here you are, right? So, uh, that's been the most impressive thing to see about you. And I think I'm changing gears even more here, um, looking at questions from the audience here, where we've been filtering a few, looking at ones that are that are more frequent, but I'm going to start going through these for the sake of time. Sure. Um, so I might bounce back around between the business side yeah, and no maybe problem. personal side of things. So, uh, so as COO, what does your role play in scaling Zoom to a high scale? I think we took, talked a little bit about scaling, but maybe more about your role in particularly as COO. Yeah, um, you know, I view my role as, you know, we have a we have a strategy or a mission, a vision that we set as a management team and as a company. And then 
I go try to make it happen. Um, so I don't cover the revenue side of the org, but on the infrastructure piece, on having the bone so that the organization can respond and can deliver that mission, that would be you know part of my responsibility. So that's how I view my role. Yeah, that's great. Uh, next question here is, um, let's see, Zoom has been one of the benchmarks for communication. What are your measures of success in the field, maybe from a qualitative, quantitative, or broad perspective? For us, it's all about reliability and quality of service. You know, we want to uh, make sure that our our users can connect when they expect to, you know, in the manner that they expect to with great mm -hmm. um, video quality, audio quality, um, and, and, and consistency of connection. That is basically our ultimate measure measurement. The other thing I would say that's a little bit more intangible, but we do sort of focus on is customer happiness. So we will bend over backwards to make sure that our customers are happy. Um, and I know that's such an amorphous concept, but it actually kind of works. You know when someone's happy and when someone's not. Um, and we strive again for that level of service where you know we're, we make our, we delight our users. Yeah, uh, well said. Uh, and uh, so there's one question on sustainability uh, and how do you as a corporation uh, tend to issues regarding corporate and technolo technological sustainability? I, you know, is it, is the question related to sort of, I'll answer some of the, the, the environmental impact per se, um, you mm -hmm. know, we are Zoom, um, we are working on some, a, a carbon calculator where you can actually kind of see how much travel you have prevented or yeah. avoided uh, by Zoom. So I would say, number one, right off the bat, we were built because our founder, you know, didn't feel the need to get on a plane to go see everyone and said, yeah. there has to be a better way. Um, and so that's one area. And then, you know, I think we as a company are also, you know, finding our way. Um, we have become probably the most recognizable brand right now on from a, from a, from a usage perspective, because we are powering human connection. Um, and that brand has power. And what we are realizing is we need to put it to good use. So we are spending mm -hmm. a lot more time thinking about our own sort of diversity and inclusion efforts, thinking about our, the, the, our own sort of mechanisms and how we, um, what policies are in government, various governments around the world, what do we support, what, we, what do we not support, et cetera. And I think all of those things ultimately drive an impact. I'll admit, we are relatively new to this, and so we're still feeling our yeah. way through it. But from a from a from an environmental perspective, definitely the number one sort of gain. There was a joke, you know, we had one of our clients, our banking clients, tell us that, you know, if you compare the number of hours and the number of sort of carbon contribution contribution that person had to what our CEO had. Um, it's ridiculous because it's like two hours versus, you know, 555 in a certain given period of time. It's amazing um, what you can do over video that you could, we would have done over travel before. So I think that that's a big, the biggest contributor for us. I have to definitely say it's very measurable, you know, in terms of what you guys have been doing uh, from a sustainability perspective. And, um, but also I think it's just been, you know, sort of, you know, hardwiring it in our brains that, hey, this is a way of doing it. Not, yeah, I know the yeah. other guy's going to be, or person is going to be comfortable doing this. So it's not like I'm the only person that wants to go on video. So that, that part, I think, is going to make a future change as well in, in our behavior and, and, and the way that we're, what we're used to doing in terms of our jobs. Absolutely. Speaking of jobs, other question is around trends. We talked a little bit about working from home hybrid model. Do you see changing job trends with the rise of using Zoom? And now that all the operation, a lot of the operations are shifting more virtually? like type of jobs and these kind of things? Um, I, I think there has been an opening of the possibilities. A couple of things have happened. You know, for, for example, you know, I used to, my husband and I used to go in for a personal trainer once a week in our small little sleepy downtown where we live. And when the pandemic hit and gyms were closed, she went on Zoom and started you know, training on Zoom and I have stuck with it on Zoom. And so it's, you know, it's gone from an hour session to maybe a more compact, um, intensive 30 minute session, three times a week. Um, and she's, all of her clients have shifted to this Zoom modality. 
And now when gyms have been opening back up, nobody wants to go back in. They love the flexibility and the ease with which you can just work out from home and sort of move on. You skip your commute, et cetera. So all the same reasons. And I asked her, you know, how's business? And she's like, oh my gosh, it's booming. It's even better. And so I think it offers more economic opportunity to a whole group of people that otherwise wouldn't have it in different business models. And so she's now just moved. She went from, you know, so sort of Bay Area, California to Idaho and hasn't lost her client base. And I, you know, I continue to work out with her because of that reason. She's very good and it doesn't really matter where she is. And with Zoom, I mean, she can even correct my form. You know, she can say you're, you're, you're not actually doing that properly and you're taking the lazy way out. So, you know, that's, I would say, a, a di offering different, more people the chance to do more and sort of offering yeah. more economic opportunity. The other thing I would say is, you know, it opens up the, the, the hiring pool. Um, you're no longer limited to a specific region, a geography. Yeah. You go where the talent is and, and you don't force the person to come to you, which, which again is more inclusive from, if you think about it, you're, a lot of people can't up and leave their situations and, and move for a job. So you're being more inclusive and you're going to, you're, you're addressing more of your needs, the company needs by finding the talent where they are. I would say the biggest challenge with that, that I do see is time zone differentials. It is tough. Sometimes, you know, as a California company, uh, a lot of the times our customers will, you know, calls go through like 3 p.m., 4 p.m., et cetera. And then you have your internal touch bases, if you will. Um, there have been situations, especially when we were under a crush of growth, where our East Coasters wouldn't eat dinner with their families on a, for a consistent basis day after day. I mean, that that is not sustainable. I think we do have yeah. to figure out ways to work with each other where, you know, those, those, you enable those human elements. Like I, I need my employees to have dinner with their kids or dinner with their families. That's very important. And not, you know, once in a while you can, you, it's fine to miss that, that, that important life event, but not on a consistent basis. I think that's the biggest challenge that I face. Yeah. And that's great that you have that viewpoint from a humanistic perspective. And obviously you can see why the culture must be great. Uh, at Zoom, having you there. And one of the questions actually is asking about uh, saying, coming in as a relatively young COO, I guess this, you look very, your appearance looks very good here. Okay. <laughs> what, uh, yeah. what, what advantages are there to working in a tech company as being part of a younger generation? Are there any challenges as well? Interesting question. I feel old, I'm gonna be honest with yeah. you. <laughs> The filters are working. I, yeah, I <laughs> yeah. look at like my kids and how they've adopted Zoom. I think they know our product better than I do. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's all how you look at it, right? Like I just, yeah, I don't Instagram and I sometimes I feel old. <laughs> yeah. Not on social media. My assumption much. is that, you know, people assume yeah. Silicon Valley, uh, you know, has a bunch of, you know, older generation folks sitting around, in, you know, in cubicles and making decisions, but that you're coming in with a very fresh viewpoint and, you know, um, yeah. in a different generation, right? So I think that's probably what they're asking being that most of these delegates right. are much younger. Well, yeah. I would say, I, I, I think you have to adapt and change and regardless of your age, I think I've seen so many 20 year olds who are sort of fixed and immovable and, you know, 60 year olds who aren't. I told you my, 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 my aunt who's in her, now in her seventies is probably one of the most dynamic people I've ever met. And she's in her seventies. Um, she's running a 4,000, 5,000 person organization and delivering revenue wow. for her, you know, delivering revenue for her shareholders and her board. And I mean, is so energized by it. Sometimes I think she's more energy than me. So I think it's in your mindset, I would say. And obviously we have, we all have some physical limitations um, and some more than others, but I would say it's in your mindset. And the, the one thing that we know for certain is that life is going to change and mm -hmm. we have to be able to adopt that and sort of be open to it. Yeah, I think it's very good food for thought. A um, couple more questions and then a uh, couple more, uh, more fun questions before we wrap things up here. Um, so, uh, regarding the platform itself, how do you guys, and I think this is probably something for people who may not know as much about the other platforms. How do you guys, 
uh, differ from, from the other platforms out there? Pretty basic. I would say number one, question. it's reliability yeah. and quality. It just works. Yeah. You click on the link, you connect. You do, I mean, we've been here for over an hour. I don't think we've had any issues. Um, I've heard you crystal clear. And right. I hope yeah. you've heard me. Likewise. And everything is yeah. just working. And I didn't really think about it. I'm just thinking about my, how to answer your questions. That is number one. It just works, I would say. The other thing I would say is we we are so quick to incorporate feedback and put that tangible feedback into our new releases. The speed at which we come out with new features and new releases is pretty tremendous. And the whole entire organization is able to move with a sort of agility that I haven't seen before. So the ultimate driver is sort of delivering customer happiness. And I think that's something that we do well. Mm -hmm. Uh, so let's switch gears one more time here before we wrap up and uh, say, so you're an alum, alumna of Harvard Law School, which is fantastic. Uh, and for all the Harvard graduates who are looking forward to going back on campus this fall uh, and exploring much of Harvard, what was your favorite study spot on the law school campus? This I couldn't, you know, I wouldn't know. Favorite so, study spot. Would you have a favorite study spot? Do you, do you think studying is favorite? I don't know. I love the <laughs> law school library. It's so mm -hmm. beautiful. Um, yeah. I think my favorite study spot would have been the library, if you can get a spot during exam time, but yes. The library, okay, that's very appropriate. And, and no wonder you, you've excelled. Uh, uh, if you had to pick one book that influenced either your work worldview or personal growth the most, which would you choose? Any other special book recommendations for the audience? You know, I see good in most things that I read. Um, I don't, I was thinking about this question. I don't know how to pick a particular book. It could be anything from, you know, self-help books. Um, Eric, mm -hmm. our CEO talks about the speed of trust and I've read it a couple of times. It's, it's tough to get through because it is quite a long book but the message is so good. Um, so everything from that all the way to Harry Potter. I mean, I know it sounds so yeah. crazy but I remember reading Harry Potter as an adult and thinking to myself, how fantastical. I mean, as an adult, you can get so enthralled and you can imagine that you're the characters and you can throw yourself into this world. How wonderful for this author to create that for a bunch of adults, you know, not even just the kids yeah. who read it, but, you know, the adults and how entertaining, how gratifying, how wonderful. And so, you know, to that point about how do you, you know, the, the, the question about whether, you know, how, how I manage as a young executive in, a, in the tech world. Oh my goodness. If you are able to create that kind of fiction and sort of enthrall a bunch of adults in a childlike way, I mean, anybody, anything is cap any, anything can happen and anybody is capable of anything. I mean, I would say that, the, that is my biggest takeaway when I, when I read books, I love reading about whether it's Michelle Obama or, mm -hmm. you know, even Trevor Noah, so interesting aspects of their life yeah. and what are one or two things I can take away from them. The other thing I would say is I like books that make me laugh. So, you know, you know, anything about by Mindy Kaling, anything by Trevor Noah, you know, I, they're just funny. So you learn something, but at the same time, you just laugh on the side, which is great. And it's also an escape from the seriousness and pressures of business, right? It's good to have the creative totally. outlet, something not related. So I, yeah, to, to the audience as well, I would totally concur with what you're saying be very well-rounded in what you're reading, how you're spending your time, because we're all human at the end yep. of the day. Um, and uh, I guess the last question is, uh, you know, what is the best piece of advice you've ever received? And I mean, obviously it sounds like your aunt was very influential, but maybe in the, you know, as you were making pivotal decisions in your life about either going to law school or where you would work uh, during those times or while you were at work, you know, what, what was the best sort of thing you've either received yeah. or you've realized? The best piece of advice I received um, actually comes up over and over again. You know, so many times when we want to advance in life, we look at the world from our perspective and what will it do for me? And then we, yeah. when people ask us like, why do you want something? Again, it's from your perspective. Well, this will help me do this or I want this. And so much of it is answering or addressing a need that someone else has. So if you look at an interview situation, for example, I mean, the hiring manager mm -hmm. that is interviewing you has a need that isn't getting met. And that is why they're looking for this person. If you, if you approach it from your perspective, say, 
I would like more money. I would like a better title. I think I need to progress in my career. It's all from your vantage point. Like, what are you offering as opposed to what are you giving as opposed to what are you taking? And I think yeah. that has been the biggest piece of advice. It came pretty early for me. And it's, and it's come back to me in different ways, different manifestations from different people. But if I were to say one key element is thinking about what you give and how that is relevant to the person on the other side and how can that benefit the person? What can you do to make that person's life better? I think looking at life in that way and creating that as your filter, it comes back to you in spades. You, it's ironic. Mm -hmm. If you look at it from the other person's point of view, or you look at it, actually, it'll end up benefiting you, and you don't even, and the 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 by a multiplier that is much larger than you can ever imagine. Yeah, and it sounds like if you were to give advice to, to other folks, everyone on this call would be sort of in the same light. Or how would you, you know, turn back around to you the question: what, What's the greatest piece of advice that you'd want to give to everyone here in leaving? You know have fun. Like life is too short. I know so many, so many of us are taught from an early age, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do this. Like it's has to be cookie cutter. Life is not cookie cutter. Things happen for a reason. You can get super disappointed, super sad, um, may not turn out the way in which you imagined, but there is some learning and that you can take from every situation and apply. One of the things that, you know, Ray Dalio, this famous guy, he has these principles he says that, you know, from pain plus reflection comes progress. And I think that's really right. Like if we had a life that was much, you know, just all roses and petals um, and we didn't have an opportunity to, to fail and then reflect on it, you wouldn't be able to progress. Um, humankind wouldn't be able to progress. And I think that that's very important to keep in mind. That is so true. Being iterative, both from a product side, which you guys have done well, and also personally, which you're doing very well. Are very inspirational and I just really wanted to thank you for your time. Uh, I know you're super busy. Thank you, a David. Super busy company, I really appreciate but, it. <laughs> yeah, this was so great for myself and I'm, I'm hopefully for all the delegates. It sounds like they were very excited and inspired as well and I guess I'll, I'll bounce it back to Amy. Oh yeah, that was amazing and it's a wonderful note to end on as well. Um, and so from my end and on behalf of our HPR staff, um, thank you, Parna, um, for thank you. this opportunity to talk um you know as we are using zoom to make this event happen it's honestly super cool and you know from transparency it's also like just catering to the everyday customer um and just to highlighting the importance of like different ways of thinking i think those are some of the biggest takeaways among others from our chat and also thank you david uh for facilitating this conversation and also for tying in your experiences um i think that was a great addition and so we appreciate the both of, of course, you it was so much fun